solution on the surveillance issues. I mean, part of what you're talking about today is restoring the public trust, yeah. and the public has seen you evolve from when you were in the U.S. Senate to now. And, and even as recently as June, you said that these, the process is such that people should be comfortable with it. And now you're saying you're making these reforms and people should be comfortable with those. So why should the public trust you on this issue? And why did you change your position multiple times? Well, uh, I think it's important to, to say, Carol, first of all, I, I haven't evolved in my assessment of the actual programs. Um, I consistently, have said that when I came into office, I evaluated them. Some of these programs I had been critical of when I was in the Senate. Uh, when I looked through specifically what was being done, uh, my determination was that the two programs in particular that had been at issue, 215 and 702, offered valuable intelligence that helps us protect the American people, and they're worth preserving. What we also saw was that some bolts needed to be tightened up on some of the programs. So we initiated some additional oversight reforms, compliance officers, audits, and so forth. Um, and if you look at the reports, even the disclosures that Mr. Snowden's put forward, all the stories that have been written, uh, what you're not reading about is the government actually abusing these programs and uh, you know, listening in on people's phone calls or inappropriately reading people's emails. What you're hearing about is the prospect that these could be abused. Now, part of the reason they're not abused is because these checks are in place. And those abuses would be against the law and would be against the orders of the, uh, the FISC. Having said that, though, if you are outside of the intelligence community, if you are the ordinary person and you start seeing a bunch of headlines saying the U.S., Big Brother, looking down on you, collecting telephone records, etc., well, understandably people would be concerned. I would be too if I wasn't uh, inside the government. And so in light of the changed environment where a whole set of questions have been raised, some in the most sensationalized manner possible, uh, where these leaks are released drip by drip, you know, one a week to kind of maximize uh, attention and uh, see if, uh, you know, they can catch us at some imprecision on something. In light of that, it makes sense for us to Go ahead, lay out what exactly we're doing, have a discussion with um, Congress, have a discussion with uh, industry, which is also impacted by this, have a discussion with civil libertarians, and see, uh, can we do this better? I think, I, th I think the main thing I want to emphasize uh, is I don't have an interest in the people of the NSA don't have an interest in doing anything other than making sure that where we can prevent a terrorist attack, where we can get information ahead of time, that we're able to carry out that critical task. We do not have an interest in doing anything other than that. And we try to set up a system that is as fail-safe as so far, at least, we've been able to think of to make sure that uh, these programs are not abused. But people may have better ideas. And people may want to jigger slightly sort of the balance between uh, the information that we can get versus the incremental uh, encroachments on privacy that, uh, if haven't already taken place, might take place in a future administration or as technologies develop further. And the other thing that's happening is, is that as technology develops further, technology itself may provide us some additional safeguards. So for example, if people don't have confidence that the law, the checks and balances of the court and uh, Congress are sufficient to give us confidence that 
government's not snooping. Well, maybe we can embed technologies in there that prevent the snooping, regardless of what uh, the government wants to do. I mean, there may be some technological fixes uh, that provide another layer of assurance. Uh, and so those are the kinds of things that I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to having a conversation about. No, I can't. Well, the, the, the fact that I said that the programs are operating uh, in a way that prevents abuse, that continues to be true without the reforms. The question is, how do I make the American people more comfortable? Right. Um, if I tell uh, Michelle that I did the dishes, now, granted, in the White House, I don't do the dishes that much, but back in the day, and uh, and she's a little skeptical. Well, I'd like her to trust me, but maybe I need to bring her back and show her the dishes, um, and not just have her take my word for it. Uh, and so, you know, uh, the. The program is, uh, I am comfortable that the program currently is not being abused. I'm comfortable that if the American people examined exactly what was taking place, how it was being used, what the safeguards were, that they would say, you know what, these folks are following the law uh, and doing what they say they're doing. But. Um, it is absolutely true that with the expansion of technology, this is an area that's moving very quickly, with the revelations that have depleted public trust, that if there's some additional things that we can do uh, to build that trust back up, then we should do them. Uh, John McCarl. Thank you, Mr. President. You have said that Poor Al Qaeda has been decimated, that its leaders are on the run. Now that we've seen this terror threat that has resulted in embassies closed throughout the Arab world, much of Africa, do you still believe that Al Qaeda has been decimated? And if I can ask in the interest of transparency, can you tell us about these drone strikes that we've seen over the last couple of weeks in Yemen? Um, what I said in the same uh, National Defense University speech back in May that I referred to earlier, is that poor Al-Qaeda is on its heels, has been decimated, but what I also said was that Al-Qaeda and other extremists have metastasized into regional groups that can pose significant dangers. And I'd refer you back to that speech just back in May, where I said specifically that although they are less likely to be able to carry out spectacular homeland attacks like 9-11, they have the capacity to go after our embassies. They have the capacity, potentially, to go after our businesses. They have the capacity to uh, be destabilizing and disruptive in countries where the security apparatus is weak. And that's exactly what we are seeing right now. So it's entirely consistent to say that uh, tightly organized and relatively centralized Al-Qaeda that attacked us on 9-11 has been broken apart and is very weak and does not have a lot of operational capacity. And to say we still have these regional organizations like uh, AQAP that can pose a threat. They can drive potentially a truck bomb into an embassy wall and can kill some people. Um, and so uh, that requires us then to uh, make sure that we have a strategy that uh, is strengthening those partners so that they've got their own capacity to deal with what are potentially manageable regional threats if these countries are a little bit stronger and have more effective CT and so forth. Uh, it means that uh, we've got to continue to be vigilant and go after uh, known terrorists who are
potentially carrying out plots or, plots or are going to uh, strengthen their capacity over time because they're always testing the boundaries of well maybe we can try this maybe we can do that um, so this is this is a ongoing process um, we are not going to completely eliminate terrorism what we can do is to weaken it and to, uh, strengthen uh, our, uh, our partnerships in such a way that uh, it does not pose uh, the kind of uh, horrible threat uh, that we saw uh, on 9/11, uh, and you know I'm not going to discuss uh, specific uh, operations uh, that have taken place. Again, in my speech uh, in May, I was very specific about how we make these determinations uh, about uh, potential lethal strikes. Uh, so I would refer, refer you to that speech. Uh, I will not have a discussion about operational uh, issues. Ed Henry. You would defend me as well? I would. Okay, thank you. I want to ask you about two important dates that are coming up. October 1st, you've got to implement your signature health care law. You recently decided on your own to delay a key part.